Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Charles from Channel Books on Stereo, and I'm here today to give you my interview with the one, the only, Zachary Weber. And y'all, this interview was like such a long time in, in the making, I guess you can say. So I'm so excited to be sharing with this, sharing this interview with you guys right now. And I'm gonna stop talking and let's get into the interview. Let's take it back to Past Charles. <music> Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Charles from Channel Books on Stereo, and today I have one of my favorite narrators here today on my channel. I have the one, the only Zachary Weber on my channel. It feels like this was like a long time coming, so I'm so excited that we got the time to like sit down and talk because I've it been dying so to interview Sorry. you. It's I'm been so... it's been so long. It's my it's fault. Like, it's been like ten years. It's, it's been like years. 50, it's been like fifty decades. I know. It's been a long time. That's so long. It's my fault. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at scheduling. I'm just, I'm a bad person. It's okay. And I got constantly distracted by audiobooks. I'm like, Absolutely. I'll, 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 re I'll respond. But first, let me listen to this audiobook real quick. Yeah. And then I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I appreciate that because that means we're, we, we act similarly in these situations. Right? But the first question I want to ask you is how did you kind of get into narrating audiobooks and then specifically romance? Yeah, so I mean, it started with romance, um, and um, yeah, I my mother introduced me to this woman, Colleen Hoover. I was just like an actor about to move to LA. Really? I, I yeah, I went to NYU, studied theater, and I was just like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna be a movie star in two years, right? And um, you know, that obviously didn't happen and that's okay but what before i even moved out um and moved to la my mom like was like this is my son here's his headshot and like mm -hmm. all these like you know in the, the the budding genre of like new adult romance um all these authors they you know they were like oh my goodness he's so cute look at him and then Colleen Hoover like wanted a trailer for one of her books and um I was like okay um I can do that and so I like you know hired some friends and we filmed this like highly cinematic like <laughs> Terrence Malick looking thing yeah. um for uh I forget the name of the book but there's a it's somewhere online now I think um but uh yeah but I did voiceover on it and I just like she had this text she wanted included and like really that's the only prompt she gave me was this poem the characters of mm -hmm. poetry like an English teacher who writes poetry mm -hmm. and so I used that as the VO background to this like little cinematic piece and it uh she loved it I mean it made her mom cry um and uh you know nice so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I guess I, I guess I'm, I am a producer actor now. Um, sure. And then, yeah. And then I start like, it was, I really don't know the time, but like, like around that time, mm -hmm. the timing, I mean, around that time, the timing of the time there was, uh, I was hired by a couple other authors. Like, um, I, I can't remember who, like Jamie McGuire, um, mm -hmm she who must not be named at this point as far as I can tell um but but like but they just started hiring me to do their yeah. books randomly because they just you know I guess it was an actor they knew um and so it just that started and then it just it it, it was sort of a slow burn but then it really took off uh after I did gray um and, but yeah I so it really started with romance so there's there's never been a time it wasn't romance Oh, yeah. okay. And just now I'm starting to branch off into into mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, but romance has kept me, you know, afloat in this oh. in my career. That's cool. Because I believe you, you have narrated some of Co Colleen Hoover's books too, right? Yeah. After, quite a, after that trailer. Quite a few. Yeah. Um, yeah. November, November 9th, 9. November 9. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a bunch of them um they're i mean they're great they're really solid sweet just compact mm -hmm. like fun books to read she's very funny yeah. which like i really value you know because i it's it's not like always 
that somebody that an author is like striving for comedy um mm -hmm. but uh you know people try to sprinkle it in and mm -hmm. and she does a great job of making you cry and laugh uh, at the same page. time yeah. you mentioned that you're branching off a little bit so like what other type of genres outside of romance are you interested in doing more of well i would just really love to do uh horror um i yeah i auditioned for a horror thing the other day that's like based on a a reddit story thread that someone started and then they wrote a book and it's about like a couple in this like mysterious paranormal disturbance mm -hmm. out at their cabin or whatever and it's just i only read like four pages of it and i was like this is awesome you know this is Ooh. my one of my favorite film genres is horror um mm -hmm. so you know that's exciting to me but i you know i like thriller espionage stuff too and that's actually i'm in the middle of doing a david baldacci book right now and oh that's that, amazing yeah it's really cool and i got that through the guy who runs the studio i work out of he like mm -hmm. he'll have me audition for stuff mm -hmm. um and yeah so that's and it's like you know it's a case of not romance non-romance so therefore i'm doing the whole book and so it's a mm -hmm. it's a, little, a lot of work but it's it's mm -hmm. exciting you know and one question too that i have um now that we're seeing so many independent audiobook production companies coming up have you seen like a different we can talk specifically for romance have you seen like a more diverse array of romances that you're getting to do versus like what it was like maybe a couple of years ago yeah i mean I, I mean, everybody's producing independently now. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I don't, I mean, diverse in the sense that like, there is, I, I, I there's a lot more to do, you know, mm -hmm. um, given the like sort of um, the difference between doing something live action and doing something over voiceover, I was pretty vocal about the fact that I wanted to, you know, limit myself to uh, characters and protagonists specifically that were of my, you know, background and visage. <laughs> um, so like, it doesn't, it hasn't really changed much for me because it's still like, you know, guys who play hockey, guys who are uh, uh, billionaires, you know, rock yeah. stars. <laughs> and the like and you know that hasn't changed much but it is nice to see the diverse like the amount of authors grow like it's mm -hmm. nice to see like a big like you know uh uh, uh sort of mma fight of <laughs> of like different different styles and competing ideas mm -hmm. you know um yeah. but i think it i think I think really right now it's like sort of in a stasis and it will, and then it'll open up and it'll be like, whoa, like now that everybody knows that this is happening and is jumping on board, this is gonna, it's going to flow into something even bigger. And there's going to be just everything under the sun you can imagine. And do you find that, um, I guess so now since like narrative becoming like brands within, a, within themselves, do you find that authors tend to like write if they know like, hey, exactly what is going to be doing in my audio book? Do they write to like certain your certain strengths or like certain like accents that you like to do? Do you find your work becoming more tailored to from more in a wheelhouse? Yeah, from from what I've heard um, from some authors, that's definitely true. They're writing with me in mind, which is cool. I mean, I you know I the, uh, they probably know me better than I know myself at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I you know it's. It, I know it to be true. Yeah. Um, and I, it's f interesting to see the distinction because I, now I can start to see like, they didn't write this for me and, but they just trust me with it, you know, uh, okay. and either way I'm, I'm, I, I feel now that I've been doing it for so long that there's a, just a general trust. They're like, this is my baby and I want you to adopt it and take care of it. Now that, um, with audiobooks, especially in romance, you're starting to see more duet instead of dual narration and full cast as well. Do you have a preference as like uh, as a narrator yourself, like which one you prefer to do more of and which ones you would like to see more of? Yeah, here's the thing. Duet feels easier because mm -hmm. when I 
when I'm doing duels, sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm essentially missing half the story. And I am like, when you're, when you're given the, uh, the benchmarks of breaks and chapters, it starts to feel sometimes like, like, it's not like, it's not like it can't, it doesn't flow with the way I work. Like if it, it doesn't, because it's not continual work, mm -hmm. this is just work wise. I, I mean, I don't know about, you know, actually ingesting the piece, but like when it's duet, I, you can just keep going. Cause you're like, okay, I got that done. I got that done. I got that little piece done so I can go on to the big chunk. Okay. If I get the big chunk done, then I'm, then I'll feel fine to like do a bunch of little chunks, you know, mm -hmm. um, chunks, chunks, chunks. And, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to do duet. That's what I'll say. But dual, it seems like, it seems like both have their benefits. I don't really, I don't listen to romance audiobooks. So I don't, so really? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I only listen to like nonfic spiritual text. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I could have let it slide if you said like maybe mystery thrillers. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But nonfiction, okay. Yeah. I respect that. Well, I respect that. I mean, I, I, I will say, okay. I mean, it's a mix. I listen to some true okay. crime podcasts. I'm one of those people. Okay. But I, I don't know. I haven't, I just haven't gotten there yet. When I'm reading, I, I read a, a, a novel. Like, because mm -hmm. I don't trust most narrators even if they're like seasoned famous actors like i don't i don't know not that uh, not that there aren't plenty of great narrators i just don't want to breach the world yet like i want to read a novel with my idea of all the characters mm -hmm. you know it's like it's it is akin to having a whole world built in your head of what you know hogwarts is and then mm. going to see it and the movies and it's kind of like that was exciting, but it's not at all the fantasy because the fantasy is just, for me, it's just, I can build that. Like my imagination is, is ludicrous, you know? Like I, yeah. I can go as far as I want. So that's why when I'm reading a novel, I'll, I will read it myself. Um, but for nonfic, it's like, all you need is a pleasant voice. Yeah. I'm curious too, in terms of your recording process, kind of take us through that. From when mm. you get the book all the way up till post production, and how does like how long does it typically take you to turn around an audiobook? So, usually I'm on a horse wandering through the desert, and I hear a beep from afar, and I say, "Chester, get to the computer," and then uh, and then I try and answer the email on time, but it takes a while. He's an old horse. And everybody gets upset at me. I'm like, it's because of my old horse. I can't get to the computer. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> that I, so yeah, I mean, I'm terrible with organization, but I, you know, I just, I get emails for jobs. I, I pretty rarely audition for stuff, um, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I moved into a house recently. That's a 20 minute walk from the studio I was already going to to record at. Um, and so I just, you know, I get up and I throw on some athleisure and I go to, I, just, I go and I record at this place and uh, it's, it's been really solid. They're great. And I just, I'm just a fixture there. Like I just, I'm there every week. Um, I have this studio here at my house in the backyard, but I don't have a booth. Um, and it's, I don't know if you know the value of some of these things, but if we want a good one, you probably got to spend at least 5,000 bucks. And Ooh. I could, you know, mm -hmm. I could, but like, I'm also like paying off debt. So it's not priority while I have such a good situation. And you know, people who keep me at least relatively on task. So I leave all the technical stuff up to them. And then this right here mm -hmm. is like a safe haven for making, for being creative and making music mm -hmm. and not like my creative work outlet. That's cool. And I was wondering too, from a scheduling perspective, does it take you longer to do duets? Cause you have to have, do you have to have that person with you in booth or right. does someone stitch it together at a later point? 
Yeah. So the way it's been working a lot recently is somebody just stitches it all together. This is a point I wanted to get to before I started going off the rails. Um, I, uh, yeah. So duet is when it's not, you know, you at least over zoom communicating with your fellow narrator, which is very hard to schedule then it has the tendency to maybe sound disjointed. I would assume that, you know, like they're not necessarily going to line up. Um, it'll line up technically, but like, are those responses going to sound like they're really there? It depends. Sometimes it does line up um, in a, in a uh, you know, in a performative sense. But I think that's kind of becoming a problem. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I can't say, cause I, cause I haven't really listened back. Um, but I think it would be, I think it would be a lot easier if like people were paid a lot more or paid what they used to be paid for duets so that you're like, okay, if I'm going to schedule this time out and not be working on my own clock, like I usually do so that I can do this duet, the scene with the person, at least over zoom. I mean, I think only one or two times have I ever been in a room with somebody <laughs> doing a duet or a multicast recording. I'm I, probably two or three times. And that would be, that would be profoundly vital, I would think, you know, because that's what people do for, um, you know, for animation and a lot of voiceover stuff so that you have the compatibility there and it's, and it's clear. Um, there are some cases, again, where duets are recorded entirely separately. I did one where I literally never even said a word to my fellow narrator. Right. And, like, we didn't even communicate over email, and it ended up sounding great. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. Cool. And, like, any funny stories from recording a book or any funny mishaps that, like, still stick with you to this day <laughs> that you go, like, oh, I remember that audiobook. I remember I had XYZ trouble with um, one chapter. <laughs> um okay i'm just gonna i i it's he's becoming such a fixture in my life um because i go to the studio all the time and he like is the guy i always work with there's this guy jared who's my who's always my engineer director and you know he's just he's just a nice guy he's just a simple guy and he just like he does his job and he he lives on the west side and he's just he's just a cool nice man um but we've fuck around a lot and I yeah and I will try <laughs> I will try to prank him constantly because I usually can read faster than he can so I'm like ahead of him a little bit so I will <laughs> if a character's coming up that's like you know just a grandma or something I will I will alter it to sound like the most silly scary grandma you've ever heard or like i'll scream as the character i'll go like for some reason full italian mobster <laughs> like what do you want to do i'll do that out of nowhere and he just and i just kill him every time and it's and it's so great and there was one thing there was one time he has like kind of I, I i imagine he has at this point like sort of a bank of all the times i've screamed and made crazy noises <laughs> um because I do it all the time. But there was one. <laughs> this is so fucking insane. I was doing like a little written piece that was like sort of like not. It wasn't an audiobook. It was like a it was like a short story that was like for someone personally. And I <laughs> and one of the characters was going. <laughs> oh God. One of the characters was going to orgasm. And he's, and he's supposed to go like, oh, fuck. And instead, I <laughs> I just screamed. I went, oh, fuck, at the top, that loud, at the top of my lungs. I just screamed like a banshee <laughs> having a heart attack. <laughs> and, and it just, we had to stop recording for like five minutes. And two, I'm curious, um, how do you feel that like now narrators, like I said earlier, are becoming brands themselves and are becoming equally as important as the author behind the audiobook? And you even have some audiobook listeners who will only go by the narrator and really won't care about the author. Like, how do you feel like, how, how has that changed from when you first started doing audiobooks 
up until now. Yeah, I mean, I don't like, you know, we're uh, romance narrators are mini celebrities where like, you know, we have this crew of like, you know, 10,000 people who think we're the greatest thing ever. And, you know, we're not <laughs> anywhere near the scale of like, they're, they're so like, I just don't think audiobook narrators have ever had that feeling before. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you have, you know, narrators who are, uh, you know, historic and have like built huge careers out of doing it. Like, you know, Scott Brick has been narrating forever and he's narrated like every book and he's incredibly prolific. Um, but it, it's, it's not like because of the nature of the content of these books, I think it's like there's a reason for obsession, you know, <laughs> as opposed to like, this is a person who narrates books. It's like, this is the person who tells me love stories and makes me feel good all the time. So it's like, there's a, there's now a sort of distinction and I, I care and I involve myself to the extent that I like communicating with everybody. And I, I like, you know, talking and, and about it and going to conventions every now and then. Um, but I, I, I don't, it's nothing beyond that. I'm nothing but me. I'm a blank slate. And then I do my work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think I'll, I'll like, I have like silly t-shirts that I jokingly made and then like managed to somehow sell at some of these, you know, the, some of the rom cons, but outside of that, you know, I, I respect anybody that does like have like a branded image based thing. And like a lot of the guys, like they can do that. Cause like that'll, you know, create them cash flow and interaction with, with listeners. And, and that's great. But I really am just like, you know, I'll, I, I like the level of communication, but I don't, I'm not building my thing mm. around it, you mm -hmm. know, because it's, it doesn't feel like, I don't know that I could ever really truly do that with anything. Like my, mm -hmm. I, my identity being something that's sold. It's like, I, I am focused on making good work mm -hmm. and, and that's it. I let's turn the camera on you, Charles. Oh, we're turning the tables on me. <laughs> um, how, how long have you been listening to, to, to books, to these audio, the romance audiobooks? Uh, I would say 14 since 2014. Wow. That's about as long as I've been doing them. Yeah. I think I did my first audiobook in 2013. Oh, really? I, what was I your first I, audio book? I think it was R Red Hill by Jamie McGuire. One of the Jamie McGuire things. Mm -hmm. But I think that's like the only one I did in 2013. And then 2014 is when I was like, oh, okay. Now it looks like I might be able to build a decent career out of this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's uh, that's around when I started. So we're, bo we're both becoming vets. We're both like season, season vets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I... I, I have to say you're not the standard demographic for these mm -hmm. for these things and I think that's the coolest thing ever I just think it's great and I'm glad you have this this platform too I think it's wonderful yeah and I wasn't always I was one of those people that did not read romance for the longest time yeah so I was like your adult literary fiction mm -hmm. mystery thrillers like kind of like high, not highbrow YA but mm. like some titles within in YA and that's like what I listened to for most of that time. It wasn't yeah. until maybe a year or two ago that I started re listening to romance. Cause at first yeah. I was like, what, is, what is this? Like, what is like, no, 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 let me go <laughs> read this book. That's going to bore me to tears, but yet I feel very fulfilled after reading it. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, in your Stephen King's, your Gillian Flynn's, like, yeah. um, your lip, like, Pachinko, like all those literary fiction, like that was my yeah. bread and butter. I was like, oh, look it. at me, look at me reading all my literary fiction. I'm so <laughs> distinguished. Yeah, like, I, I'm, I'm both well versed in the classics. And then I started reading romance. I was like, I'm trash for this now because like it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah, it's not easier, but um, it's just really consumable. Yeah, and like some of the books are like absolutely phenomenal what the authors are doing and the pace in which audiobooks are made for romance the way the authors write you, yeah. it's almost like you start reading romance and then you just get they just get a chokehold on you because <laughs> if you try I to mean, go out and read another genre you're like figuratively oh, right wait, how did this author release like six books last year like what yeah 
Yeah. I have to wait like two years for like the next Stephen King that's or something like say. that. I, that's what I always say. I'm like, they really just, some of these authors just churn them out. And I'm like, I can't even write. I want to write a book. And I started kind of writing a book like a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how do you have the confidence to get past like three pages? Like it's so hard to write. And especially when there's so much, I, I mean, when there's anything else in your schedule, you know? Mm-hmm. But I'm just, that's what I'm always impressed by is the fucking body of work. It's like, golly, you know, um, yeah. it's impressive. And also, I don't want to hear you guys dragging me in the comments. I know my ring light goes out halfway through the interview. So you can see I'm clearly lit up properly. And then the last part of the interview, I'm not. Don't judge me. There's been over the past couple of months, some recent, I would say, conversation. There was an article published about artificial intelligence and how that is improving the text-to-speech function for books. And as an audiobook listener myself, they were arguing that essentially it could supplant or reduce the amount of human narrated audiobooks that we do get. But I wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Okay. So there's, just to get technical about it, there's options. Mm -hmm. If you're a person who doesn't want to hear someone act it out, and you just want to hear the thing read and you want to, and you can, and that's essentially like reading to you. Great. Fine. Um, if you're a person who wants to hear a robot version of me, read a book, not like you're imagining the fact that like, I'm an actor who did a job. So I'm sitting down to do it and feeling it knowing that I felt it. If you don't need that and it's fine with you, that it's just the texture of my voice, I understand. But the problem is just the very basis that people are going to be out of work. (laughs) Like, you know, like I understand like that there will be certain uh, channels that are just that are just going to happen, you know, but we, I think SAG is going to probably swing pretty hard and it's going to say like, nah, we need to, you know, I, I mean, there's a world, the thing I automatically imagine when this, this like debate came about is I was like, I mean, sure. I'll like, I could like, if I've got too much on my plate, then I could for smaller titles or whatever, sell my AI self for that Mm -hmm. and make money doing nothing. That's cool, I guess. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I care, like, I, I don't, I don't really want to do that either. It was just like the first thing I thought of because like, you know, it's just when you live with like a matrix mind, (laughs) you're like, that could work. The future could work. Yeah, I could, could believe work. it. I could believe in the takeover. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm just, um, I have, I'm not on Twitter anymore. And that's been great for me. And I. That's good. Yeah. I'm proud. Twitter is not the best. I prefer no, Instagram. I prefer Instagram. Obviously it has its own problems. <laughs> um, but on Twitter, you get, you have the tendency to get angry and i know that i'd probably be more embedded in this debate right now if i was on it and i would probably understand it better but i can tell you instinctually and emotionally i don't like it and it's not only because of my not only because of my livelihood but because if i were a listener i would say no i want to know that someone did that performance mm-hmm. you know if i was someone who is interested in hearing or interested in people having jobs that they're good at, you know? I mean, we see this happen in all kinds of industry in which people are replaced. And it, and I think we've gotten so brainwashed into thinking that that's okay. Because we could employ everyone in this country automatically if the chain of production was slower, you know? Mm-hmm. Like if, we, if companies were okay with not exporting product, at the drop of a hat if they mm-hmm. if we relied on human beings and we worked together <laughs> sorry this is going into this realm no you're fine 
but like if if we if we were more of a community minded society then th then we wouldn't even be thinking this way we would be like we don't need that because someone needs that job it's just it really can be as simple as that um the problem is that it's just it's moving on without us you know mm -hmm. like and it's going to get even worse and it's going to bleed into other things and i don't think there's much stopping it and maybe the world is going to burn to a crisp before we even get there. And then there'll just be the robots and their audiobooks left. And then too, um, I know everyone's curious, what coming upcoming projects do you have on the horizon that you can tell us about? Or can you not, or are you like 100% secretive? Uh, not 100% secretive. There is that David Baldacci thing I'm doing and it's called 620 Man. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Okay. Um, it's like a big, long thriller about a former army ranger who's working at a Wall Street firm and then his former uh, girlfriend and who was also like sort of his mentor at the firm kills herself. And then he finds out that there's something much more insidious going on. It's really cool. Ooh, it's, it's, okay. a, it's a fun story. And I, I mean, uh, David Baldacci is an author that I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, that guy. Everybody's mm -hmm. grandpa has read every David right Baldacci book. And he's like, you know, he's on the shelves at Kroger when I'm when I was growing up. Yep. He's been a, that guy's been around. Um, so that's happening. Tomorrow I'm working on a video game, which has been sort of ongoing. Okay. And it's about uh Drac it's like a side scroller about Dracula, and he's on a like a dating show and he has to date all these monsters, and it's huh? wild. Oh. Okay. It's made by this indie developer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing tomorrow. And then, yeah, I mean, a million, a million romance. I have, I have a Corinne Michaels coming up. Um, I think okay. it's a small thing. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know. It, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of authors I haven't worked with yet. I'm doing a Catherine Cowles and an A.L. Oh, Jackson. Are. Yeah, she's great. I love Catherine Cowles. Mm -hmm. she's she's like in the she's in the realm of colleen hoover a little less in the in terms of comedy but she's like you know she, it's like very heartwarming but also very sexy mm -hmm. and usually like you know it just feels like the world isn't trying to like be bigger than it is you know mm -hmm. it's like simple simple little stories mm -hmm. and I could be totally wrong. I think I've only read like one or two books of hers, <laughs> but the ones I have read are like, you know, it feels very like it has like a nineties feel to it. There's something about it. That's like, it's not the Fabio nineties. It's like the lifetime movie nineties where it's like, you know, this is like tale as old as time. And these people are trying to make it work. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you know, farm style loving. So that's great. Okay. Well, I recommend her. I do recommend her. Yeah. And then my last question for you is, this is going to be a tough one. This is going to be a real doozy of a question. <laughs> do you have any audiobooks that you would recommend? It can either be romance, audiobooks that you have done, or we can do nonfiction. But I feel like my viewers may revolt. <laughs> like, why, why was that giving us nonfiction? We're here uh, for the romance. But I'm well, to you. Okay. So we're not talk we're talking any audiobook. We're not talking strictly we're not talking strictly what I've done. You can do you can you can do either. So I'm okay. allowing you options. It could be audiobooks you have done that you have listened to any genre. But I think a lot okay. of people will want romance from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's okay. We'll do one of each. We'll do one that'll appeal to the saucy, the saucy saucy queens. And one that'll appeal to the drama, drama means. <laughs> um, I am so annoying. Um, okay. that, was a, that was a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, here are the last three books I did that I, the last three romance books I did that I really liked. Mm -hmm. Ruin by Jolie Vines. Um, that one I can speak to the other two. I can't remember exactly what happened because I forget everything as soon as I've done it. And I've done 500 of these. So I, they all mix together in my head, 
but Ruin is set in Scotland and it's about these like kids who were all taken to a mental asylum and they're you know forced to like live alone and they have this scary lady who presides over them and then there's like a wealthy girl who lives nearby whose dad owns the place and she's like trying to get them out it's very interesting complicated um and lots of like accents um it's not there's not a ton of sexy and it gets there um i wouldn't even call it a slow burn because there's a lot like the character's like a brooding angry mm -hmm black hair like kind of like motherfucker who like really just he he wants it but he's like crazed and he's you know on the run and so that so that's a fun one oh, okay and then i did a serena bowen recently that was great called waylaid so those are some that i've done uh in the romance genre that i like um i i listened to this <laughs> This is not going to please anyone. Okay. Okay. There's a classic book on spirituality that connects to this uh, this doctor's experiences in Auschwitz. He was held captive in Auschwitz. And I, I know this book. Man's Search for Meaning. Victor I know Frank Victor, Victor Frankel. I read yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, so, good one. Good one. Okay. So I listened to that audiobook recently and it was well read. It was great. Mm -hmm. Um and it's fucking rough obviously, but it's um but it's also beautiful and it showcases a side that you just do not hear. Mm -hmm. That you just don't see in, you know, the Sophie's Choice and pianists uh, of the world, like those films mm -hmm. and stuff. And I haven't like read a ton of World War II literature, a lot of like Jewish stories too. Um, mm -hmm. So like this was sort of my intro into that. And it's like just a really fascinating look at that and the, and the, uh, the psychological side of it, which is, which is like, you know, like it, it displays like what, when you've lived literally the most harrowing experience ever, how does your point of reference change mm -hmm. for what is good and what is, what is benefiting? And how does your your attitude change toward your fellow man? And it's 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 phenomenal. It had me like gutted. But thank you again, Zach, so much for coming on my channel. And thank you guys so much for watching this video. And I'll catch you guys with a brand new video. Bye everyone.